Hello everyone and welcome to The Bible Study. We are a multicultural group of believers that serve and emulate the Lord Jesus Christ. Now come with us as we go step by step on this journey through the Word of God in order to study and show ourselves approved, rightfully dividing the Word of Truth. We now join in with today's session. All right, all right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Sunday. It's a beautiful day outside. This is indeed the day that the Lord has made, so we're all here to rejoice and be glad in it. I'm super excited to see all y'all beautiful faces. Y'all have done up. God has truly been good to each and every single one of you all this week. Anyway, so we're really excited. We're going to jump right on into it. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm thrilled to be here today. I know that the Lord does indeed have a word for us all. Feel like you know Psalms, uh, 122nd chapter of Psalms. Uh, I was glad when they said, "Let us come into the house of the Lord." And this is indeed the house of the Lord, because the Bible says, "Where two or more are gathered in His name, He is indeed here in the midst." And so He is here with us. And so um, thankful for all that. Just going to get straight to it. So we're going to um, real quick start off with a word of prayer. We're going to have a word of prayer by Minister Dion, and uh, then we're going to go to Sister Tanya. Uh, Sister Tanya for the welcome. Then we're going to have a wonderful song by Evangelist Williams. Looking really beautiful today too, by the way. So excited to have you all here. Be sure to please, if you join, uh, keep your phones muted so it won't interfere with any of the reception uh, going out and so there won't be any distractions. Um, yeah, so be sure to do that. And, and as soon as you finish, if you are indeed uh, going to be talking um, just after you finish just be sure to mute that back and then after the uh, lovely song selection by Minister Williams we're going to turn it right over to our Pastor Scott for the word all right thank you very much for joining us again uh, Minister Dion all right good morning everybody um, if everybody would please bow your heads in prayer with me um, Heavenly Father uh, Lord, I just want to thank you for today. I thank you for waking each and every one of us, Lord. Um, Lord, we just thank you for that message last week by Pastor Badgett. And we just pray that you're just with Pastor Scott today and just anoint his message, anoint his words, Lord. And uh, speak to us all, Lord. Speak to us personally and touch our hearts with this word. And I'm praying that you just guide, lead, and order our footsteps this week, Lord. Forgive us of all of our sins and trespasses against you, known and unknown, Lord. And uh, just praying that you just... Uh, Bless us all with wisdom to discern good and evil. But Lord, I thank you and I praise you each and every day in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hello, happy Sunday. I am Sister Tanya Marie Scott. Just wanted to uh, welcome you all to today's Bible study. Uh, still the series of forgiveness um, titled Forgive Yourself. Uh, one thing I wanted to do is challenge everyone in the Facebook group to this week, just reach out to somebody else in the Facebook group, send a little note of encouragement, um, you know, just something small, just to kind of encourage them throughout the week and just connect us. You know, we connect every Sunday here, but you know, even outside of that, just to kind of get to know each other a little bit better or invite somebody new, invite a friend to the group. Um, so, so one of those two things throughout this week. Um, I. Again, want to thank you all for participating in the questions throughout the week in our Facebook group. It is so important for us to, you know, just go back to the word throughout the week. And that's what those questions are for. Um, for example, uh, I have the man in my household who posts the question. So most of the time he's right by my side as I'm looking at the question. And a lot of times I'm like, oh, answer, right, right, you know looking at him for confirmation and you know he goes i don't know <laughs> to go to the word so you know and, and and for me that's what i need is to go to the word and figure it out for myself because then there's a little something extra i get from it as well you know that i i didn't see before so that's really 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 important you know so when we're we're going through and answering these questions i know it's easy to just go ooh. You know, Dion answered, and oh, he's usually right. So I'm just gonna, <laughs> you know, um, really, really go back to the word and and find it out for yourself because that's that's what we all need, you know. Um, so, anyways, 
thank you all for being here today. And I know that you'll be blessed by today's lesson. Amen. Our evangelist Williams, we're going to turn this over to you now for a lovely selection. We are our heavenly Father's children, and we all know He loves us one and all. Yet there are times we find we answer. Another's voice and call. Yet if we're willing, He will teach us His voice only to obey no matter where, for He knows. Yes, he knows, he knows just how much we can bear. Though the load may get so heavy, we're never left alone to bear it all if we just ask for strength and keep on toiling although the tears may fall we have the joy of this assurance our Heavenly Father, He will always answer prayer, for He knows, oh yes, He knows, I know He knows, yes, yes, He knows, you know. He knows just how much, he knows just how much, yes, he knows just how much we can bear. Wonderful, wonderful, Amen. wonderful, Amen. wonderful. Yes, Amen. Amen. Wonderful. The Lord knows just how much we can bear. My God, if that doesn't go into our lesson, I don't know what does. And we want to thank Evangelist Williams for that wonderful song and for the prayer by Minister Henley. Uh, Hensley, I want to thank God for uh, Sister Tanya with that wonderful welcome and opening. And I always want to thank Minister Emmanuel for his uh, wonderful uh, administrative skills along with that facilitating today. Um, listen, God never wastes time with anything. He always deals in the perfected time for everything. And this message today entitled, Forgive Yourself, if it were not needed, God would not even have us to talk on this. So we need to realize that some of us, and I would dare to say truthfully, all of us need some self-forgiveness. And I think the way I probably wanna start out is by simply saying this, is each and every one of us have had things in our past that we were not proud of. Things that we've done that we dare not, even till today, tell anyone about. And one of the reasons why we don't is because the guilt 
and the shame and the possibility of us being ridiculed for what we have done is overwhelming. As we do know, not everyone is going to forgive you of what you've done or me of things that I've done. And this week I've put a lot of self-examination. I've done a lot of self-examination. And in my self-examination, I realized quickly the things that were in my past that I'm very ashamed of. Things in my past that even if I were to tell you who I love and trust, I don't know if you'd be able to forgive me. And because of those type of things, we tend to harbor and hold on and embrace them. And what we've learned to do is we've learned to just kind of hide these type of things because we don't really want to be exposed. Even though we know that we're new creatures in Christ, not everything that we've done, not just since we got saved or before we got saved is what I'm referring to. Because let's just be real. There have been things even after we were saved that we're not proud of. That's called real talk. Sometimes people make it as if once you embrace the Lord Jesus and you accept him as your Lord and Savior and he cleanses you from all your unrighteousness and all your sins, that yeah, just because you were cleaned right then or cleansed right then, that doesn't mean that you're not going to do anything that's going to be detrimental to your walking God if other people heard about it or when you think about it. And just think about this. The thing that we have done, the things that we have done that we are not proud of, you should know, the enemy always said, oh, if I could just tell people about you and what you thought and what you've done, and it's all designed to hold us back. Well, today I'm going to talk about an individual who, if anyone had a reason to distrust God and to not forgive themselves is the person I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about things that he did and things that were done in his life. And these things happened after he was saved because I know how people are. Well, you know, before I was saved, I was a sinner. I was ungodly. I was, and there may be things that you've done before you were saved that still you're ashamed of since you got saved. But I'm going to talk about this individual and what he did after he got saved and things that he wasn't aware of that were in his life. Now I'll say this here, just because you don't do a particular sin does not mean that you're not capable of doing it. I'll let that sink in. Just because you don't do a particular sin does not mean you're not capable or do, of doing it. And it doesn't mean that you won't do it. One thing that we have to do is realize that when we embrace the Lord Jesus is that he is keeping us. And we cannot keep ourselves. We cannot keep ourselves from ungodliness and sin in and of ourselves. You cannot will yourself to live a saved life. It has to be more than your will you're going to need the word of God. And that's what we've been hearing all today already, hearing about the word of God. So let's go into, I want you to turn your Bible to 2 Samuel. And in 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, there's a particular situation that takes place. But I want to read to you a few of these scriptures. And then I want to discuss this and talk about it. And this is, like I said, what we're talking about uh, today is forgive yourself. So again, in 2 Samuel, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 5, and I'll begin reading. <clears throat> and it came to pass, and after the year was expired, at the time when the kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servant with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and, and besieged Rabbah. But David... But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass that in an, even, 
even uh, evening time, excuse me, evening time, that David arose off of his roof or off of his bed, excuse me, and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And David sent messengers and took her. And she came in unto him, and he lay with her. For she was, she was uh, purified from the uncleanliness, and she returned into her house. Verse 5. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. Wow. In this particular situation, we're dealing with a person I was telling you about, King David. Now, I want you to be really mindful of where David's at at this point in his life. This is not the same David that started out as we find out in scripture, because the Bible, when we really first get introduced to David in, in uh, 1 Samuel, uh, we find out in the second chapter, David goes about and kills Goliath. And we see that he brings this victory to the people of God because the children of Israel were under uh, the actual auspices and they were under the actual uh, threat of attack by the Philistines. We find out that in 2 Samuel, the eighth chapter, this same David is a David that had won many battles because after he killed Goliath, Saul made him into one of his warriors. And David was so uh, vigilant and he was so, um, he was so, uh, he just trusts God so much that he went forth at battle after battle and had victory after victory. So David was, he was very aware of who he was in God. And he was winning so many victories that the people, not only did they realize he was, he was winning these battles, but they began to sing and began to sing his praises about how David had killed thousands of thousands. And this was to honor God. It goes, the Bible goes on to say that even in 1 Samuel, the ninth chapter, that this is the same David who, because he had so much honor that his king, which was Saul, that we learned about some weeks ago, his king even wanted to kill him. And yet, even when the king wanted to kill him, God gave David opportunity, as Elder Badgett mentioned last week, to kill King Saul, and he wouldn't do it. So look at this man. He's honorable as a youth. He's making stands for God when nobody else would against Goliath, the Philistines, or anybody coming against God. He's also making stands as a warrior because he's winning battle after battle after battle. He wouldn't even hurt anybody who was even trying to destroy him if they were the children of God, which was the king. He wouldn't hurt King Saul because he said, David has so much honor. He said, I can't do this because this is God's anointed. And who knows what God is trying to work out in me. This is that same David that will give his life for his own men. This is the same David that loved everything about God and the things of God. We find out also that this same David who had had all these victories that even when Saul was killed and Saul killed himself in battle because he got wounded and he could not get healed from it. So Saul, the Bible says, fell on his own sword. And when David heard about it, the young man who came and told David that Saul was dead and that he took his, his, his actual crown and that he took also his sleeve off of him, he, he told David that Saul died in battle. And David was so hurt, he wept bitterly. And then he not only wept bitterly, but he killed the man that was there to report about Saul being killed in battle. He had him killed. So David was a man of principle. David was a man that loved things of God. 
He praised God. When David became the king, this is the same David that went and got the Ark of the Covenant and brought the glory of God back to the people of God. This was the same David who was fearless in battle. David was a man, as the Bible says, after God's own heart. And don't you know, it is a very honorable thing to be a man after God's own heart. When God says that David is a man after God's own heart, I want you to understand this, or I want us to be able to understand, just because you have a heart after God doesn't mean that your heart is all right. It doesn't mean that your mind is all right. Because as I mentioned earlier, there are things that you may say, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't steal, I don't do. You may call out all these deeds of the flesh and say all these things that you don't do. But just because you haven't done it doesn't mean that it's not in you to do. Just because you haven't done it. I want you to know something about God. And he wants you to know something about him and myself. God wants us to know that when he initially saved us, he washed away all of our sins and he put them all together. This is why that when you embrace the Lord and when we turn our life over to the Lord, he didn't have us call out every sin. Oh, Lord, I'm going to forgive you because I fornicated. Lord, I'm going to forgive you because I lied. Lord, I'm going to forgive you because I stole. Lord, we didn't go through a litany or a list of all the things that we did wrong. But don't you know that when God saved us, after he saved us, there's something that he wanted to make sure that he did. And that's what he's doing for us right now. Do you not realize that God at this time is actually showing you what he really saved us from. Because it's one thing to say, oh, I'm saved, I love the Lord. But I'm gonna tell you this, it is very, very easy to become complacent in the Lord. In other words, stagnated. In other words, not grow in the Lord. It's very easy to stop growing. And the reason we stop growing is because we get too comfortable. What do you mean too comfortable? What I mean by too comfortable is we begin to measure how we do in the Lord by how others do. We're not looking at our standard of what we do for the Lord as being what the word of God says. I heard a message today. It was a dynamic one. My pastor, uh, Pastor Allen, preached a, a message today. It's called, It's in the Book. And if it's in the book, which is the Bible, the word of God, that's our standard. But many a times we become a law unto ourselves. In other words, we agree with the Bible along, as long as the Bible agrees with us. But I want you to know there are things that we consider grievous and egregious that are in the Bible because we don't obey those things because in our mind, we feel like we're doing enough. If you have passion toward anything, it should be seen. The very way that you are toward God is how you feel about him. The Bible tells us to remember the former days when we were first illuminated, when we first got saved. Do you remember it? when you first got saved, your first love, how you felt about God? And what did we do? We said, I don't know about you. I'll tell about me. Look, when I first got saved, oh, well, you can't tell me nothing. I didn't even know scripture good. I didn't. All I knew is that I felt like this great burden was taken off of me. One songwriter said, and all my burdens rolled away. And when this burden got taken off of me, I felt free. I felt clean. I felt exuberant. I didn't know all I was supposed to do, but I knew I'm going to do something for God because he forgave me when I didn't want to forgive myself. Let's just be real about it. Most of us got saved. We weren't trying to be saved. <laughs> no, we weren't. I wasn't trying to be saved. I didn't like, 
Let me tell y'all, I'm gonna tell you how I felt about y'all Christian folk. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm gonna just can I just tell it? I'm gonna tell it. I didn't like Christian folk. I'm gonna tell you why. For one, most of the ones I knew were hypocrites anyway. Because I'm out, I'm out here doing my sin because I was enjoying sin. I was having a good time. Mind you, I was having a good time. Don't let people fool you. Now, the reason why you can't and, and others like I could not witness and get people out of their sin is because I was enjoying my sin. You can't get people out of something that you're in. You can't get people to like something that you don't like. A lot of reasons why people don't witness is because they're not in love with this life yet. Let's just be real. Because if you wanted everybody to get this life, even when I didn't have any witnessing skills, I didn't know about no uh, 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 gospel of the world and by grace and we saved. Uh, I didn't know about those scriptures. All I knew is that he forgave me. And I would go to people and I would say, hey, man, hey, are you, I didn't have any tech. I was like, hey, are you saved? You love the Lord? Uh, well, I, 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 hey, let me tell you this. I, I wouldn't even let them get their little words in there. I'm going to tell you, this is the best life. And God is so good. And he loves you. And he loves me. And because he loved me, I love you. We can love each other. And we can have eternal life, man. We don't have to die and go to hell. We can have eternal life. And he'll make it right. He'll be, I didn't have scripture. And I said, come on, man. Don't you want to be saved? Don't you want to go to heaven? Yeah, yeah. Well, you want to be saved, don't you? <laughs> Yeah, I guess, yeah. Because I was excited about it. Somewhere in the process of time, if we don't watch it, the enemy, which is the devil, he will get us to a place where we start getting comfortable with our salvation. If it becomes, as I just mentioned, our salvation, not God's salvation. And we start coming to a point where we start judging others more than we wanted others to judge us. And it is not, don't get me wrong, it is not wrong to judge people if it's a righteous judgment. Even though I know people say, well, you know, the Bible says judge and be not judged. No, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't judge. It just simply means the same measure that you meet with others, the same judgment that you put on others, make sure you understand you need to be living above that yourself. Can you imagine having a judge that you got a traffic ticket and you go to court and then while you're sitting there in court, you sit there waiting around and then they finally call your name and you go up to the front of the courtroom and then all of a sudden they said, well, how do you plead? And you say, judge, and you look up and that judge is the person who cut you off on the street, which caused you to go up and hit somebody else. And you say, wait a second. You, you're the reason why? I, well, no, no oh, I, I'm the judge. No, I can care less. You can't judge me and you've done the same thing. The Bible says, be ye doers of the word and not just hearers only deceiving yourself. So here is David. David has gotten to a place now. He is the king. And he has, he's the king, and he has all this responsibility. He's won war after war after war. And now the Bible says, as we started to the actual the, uh, 11th chapter of 2 Samuel, the Bible says, and here came a time where the kings go out to war that David sat back in the palace. Sometimes, you know what, uh, I think COVID, COVID uh, has its place, COVID, our actual pandemic that we're in, but don't let COVID make you have excuses not to serve God. Don't let your particular situation, it doesn't, regardless of what you have in your life, you may be struggling right now financially, you might be struggling right now in your health, you might be struggling in your relationship, you may be struggling in your understanding about certain things in life and just be bogged down with things. But I want you to know that does not give you a blue light not to serve God with vigor. Because I want you to know God saved us mainly from ourselves. Mainly from ourselves. 
You'd be surprised the type of person you really are. I'd be surprised the type of person I really am because I found out under certain uh, situations, I might lie, I might steal, I might do all these other type of things. Don't ever get to a place where you think you're above the fray. So what happens here is that David, he sits back and he's admiring now his kingdom. I'm David. He forgot how God protected him as a little child. He forgot how God called him to be a great servant. He forgot how even in the day that David received the Holy Spirit, that the spirit of God left King Saul and another spirit went to King Saul, which was an evil spirit, and he got the Holy Spirit at the same time. He forgot how graciously kind God was to spare his life in battles. He forgot how God showed his love. And the Bible says that God loved David so much, he even gave him his heart. So while David is there, David decides just to take a walk on the, on the rooftop of his palace. You know, it's one thing, you know, I, I, I used to say years ago, I don't say it as much, but I, I mean it though. And I'll say to you all what I used to say. If keeping you broke keeps you closer to God, then I'm glad you are. If keeping you broke keeps you closer to God, because you know when people are broke and people don't have money, they're calling on God. Oh, God, help me with this. Oh, God, help me with that. Help. Because sometimes when people get to a place where they got their finances and they got everything going for them, they get too big for God. And how you can tell how a person is in their relationship with God is by what service they render to God. By how you can tell how a person's relationship is with God is how they serve God. Are they serving God because I'm commanded to serve God or I'm told to serve God or you love God and you want to do the best you can for God? Because least we forget, the Bible said it is a fearful thing to fall into the judgment hands of the almighty God. It's a fearful thing. But God loves us so much. He commended his love toward us so much that he gave his only begotten son. Now, I would say this to you all. You all know Emmanuel is my son. And I, I cannot think of how many uh, millions of people, <laughs> let's just be real, how many people would have to give their life before I give up my son? That's my son. That's my flesh and blood. That's my humanity as a father. But imagine your son being a God and who have done no wrong, have never done any sin, and then God, the Father, sends Jesus, his only begotten son, to be killed by an evil race of people, by people who were born in the sin, and as David says, shaping in iniquity. He gave his son, and if he would give his son his life for us, who, as the Bible said, were yet dead in our trespasses and sins, we need to be given our life to him. And again, how we serve him is how we give our life to him. So let's look at this, uh, what happens. David's on his balcony and David looks. And while he's looking, all of a sudden he sees this woman. It seemingly, we're getting a panorama view into something through the eyes of David, because I want you to know, in order for us to read about this would happen, David had to tell someone this story and had to have them write it down. Don't think that we're just getting this view and this is something that just God decided to say himself. No, David's writing. He's scribing what happened in his life because here is the same great king that's over millions of people, has a great palace and over all these things, has no, he, he's destroyed mostly all of his enemies. But yet he looks and sees this young lady and he's like, she's naked and she's bathing herself. From his view, 
He's a king. He's in a palace so he can see all the people out there. And when David saw him, something arose up in him. And he said, I want this woman. And he inquired, who is she? And they said, who is this? This is Bathsheba. But David, this is Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. So David sent for her. Let me tell you something. We don't always slip and fall into a sin. You don't slip and fall into fornication. You don't slip and fall into adultery. People don't slip. That's not a slip. That was premeditated. It's thought out. It was asked. You remember now, if you look at the, to the story, David asked and inquired of her. He didn't just ask, who is she? And that he just left it at that. He asked and he is inquiring of it. Don't you know, many times, the very things that we struggle with, the very sins that are in our life that we struggle with is because we're inquiring of it, first of all, mentally. You can't tell everybody this, but you definitely want to know about it. And the Bible says, they came and said, but this is Bathsheba and she's Uriah's wife. And David didn't care. What? No doubt. If you ask David, let's place a pause. Let's pretend like we don't know the rest of the story. Let's put a pause in the, in the situation right now and say, David, what are you inquiring about Bathsheba? That's Uriah's wife. What is it that you need to know? Why are you inquiring and having her to come to your palace? Oh, if you let David answer it at that point, David would have said, oh, I just, you know, I just didn't know who she was. I thought she was nice. And I just want to see, how's Uriah doing? Because I know Uriah's at the battle. Have you heard from your husband? Is everything okay? That's if we didn't know the rest of the story. Because sin always paints itself in virtuous colors to make it look innocent. I'm going to say that again. Sin always paints itself in virtuous, that means beautiful, colors in order that it doesn't look that bad. I mean, come on. David's just inquired. Wait a second. You know this is King David. You don't, wait, you don't think he, let me tell y'all something. I just want, let me just, I got to get it real, real. This is a real, real day. I appreciate the honor that you all give to me as your pastor and as a man of God. And I try to live every day that way. But don't you ever, don't ever make me God. Don't ever make me a substitute for God. Don't ever make me to a place where you think that Pastor Scott cannot slip and fall into a sin. Now, that doesn't mean assume that I am. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying don't reverence me like you reverence God. Because the Bible says God will not share his glory with anyone. With anyone. So here David is, he calls for this woman and he finds out that she's past her time of purity. Ladies, you already know she wasn't on her cycle. So then David laid with her. Who laid with her? David. Wait a second. Wait a second. Y'all lying to me? Y'all lying? Uh-uh, not David. I'm going to tell you. No, I'm going to tell you why it wasn't David. See, sometimes... We can put our trust in this flesh so much that we won't even believe it when it's right in front of your face. Sometimes we can put so much trust in this flesh. This body, this flesh wants to sin. It is a magnet. I remember myself and Ministry Emmanuel were having a conversation one day and we were talking about sin in this flesh. And this flesh is a magnet to sin. It will, when it sees sin, it will go, even if well, you don't even have to think about it, it's going to go that way. It will find that way. David, the same David who had many wives, let me clarify this, give you a little bit more instruction and understanding. The same David that had many wives, this is the same David now that is now an adulterer. He's now laying with another man's wife. And the Bible said, because David thought he got away with it. 
The Bible says like this, anything done in darkness shall be manifested by the light. The Bible says, David, he lay with her. She went back home. And then as time progressed, because when you read in the Bible, sometimes when we read from one scripture and two more scriptures down, you might think, well, that just happened to five minutes ago. No, she didn't get pregnant five minutes ago. David's been having a relationship with this woman for months. Because you know, even now, it takes a little while for them to determine if you're pregnant. That's because that's with all the high, uh, you know, technology that we have right now. But then it was different. But but Sheba realized I'm pregnant, and she let David know. Now David's thinking about it. I would say this to you all. Do your thinking about the sin that you're planning or desirous of and leave it in your head before you put it into action. It is a difference between what you think about and what you do because the devil could put thoughts in your mind. Just think, the devil did tempt Jesus with the whole world. So you can have thoughts in your mind and it because, because it came from the devil, it's not that it's your thoughts, it's because the devil put those thoughts in your mind. But if you act it out, it's on you. It's on you. So David now realizes, oh my God, but she was pregnant. Her husband is out fighting the battle for me because he's one of my soldiers. So David thinks, what do I need to do? So what he does is he devises a plan and I want you to see what I consider and what I call the progression of sin. Sin is not stagnated ever. Boy, we could learn something from sin. And the devil is always working. Boy, we can learn something from the devil too. He's always working to try to tear down everything that was built up in the lives of the saints. That's why we should always learn how to build up everything that the devil tore down in the lives of the saints. We should always be working to build up whatever the devil's tore down in any of our lives. Like Sister Tanya said earlier today, we need to communicate. The Bible says, know them that labor among you. But if you don't even pick up the phone and call them or meet them or talk to those that are around you, you, you just, hey, we're just here. We're in, a, we're in our square. We're in our own little box. So David devises a plan. He calls up, he goes and calls for his head general, whose name was Joab. And he says, I want you to send Uriah back to me. Send him to my palace. So then Joab goes out to where they're in battle. He finds actual Uriah, who is Bathsheba's husband. And David has him sent to the palace. So David has him come to the palace. Now, as we're talking about this, the progression, how sin gets worse and worse. If you don't nip it up and nip it out as a, at the bud, it's going to grow. If you don't cut it down at the root, it's going to grow. So here it is. David goes and calls for Uriah to come to see him. And Uriah comes and sees him. He says, Uriah, you've been really doing a great job uh, out there in battle. And I know that you're very dedicated to the kingdom. What I want you to do, I want you to go home and just relax and enjoy yourself and make sure you take time out for your wife. Did you see what I just said? The same David, who was the man after God's own heart. When was this said? This was said before David had done anything because the Bible says that when Samuel went to look for someone, God said, I'm going to send you to someone who has a heart after me. Just because you don't do a certain thing does not mean you're not capable of doing a certain thing. So the Bible says this. He goes and calls Uriah and then tells Uriah to go home and to be with his wife and to try to make it look like he was really so proud of Uriah. But in all actuality, David had slept with this man's wife, had already been an adulterer with his man's wife, and now he's trying to cover up his sin. Sin is too big to cover up. Sin, it does not matter where it is. Any unforgiven sin, it only festers. 
and it begins to grow. And as it grows, it adds that much more of layers and layers to it and so much that the person can't even penetrate it because now that same thing that was a little thing, the Bible says it's the small foxes that spoil the vine. The Bible says it's a little leaven that leavens the whole lump. Now David is trying to cover up his sin. This great king of all of Israel, this great man of valor, this great man who loved the things and the people of God has an issue he didn't know about before he got saved. And once he got saved, he didn't realize he was an adulterer. He had that in his spirit. He had that mentality. If you'd asked David before them, oh, you might have got your head cut off by David first. And he would have done it sincerely because sometimes we don't really realize what's in us. We don't really realize what's in us. So he sends Uriah home to Bathsheba. And then Uriah, mm, 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 sometimes even telling this story just gets me. Uriah wouldn't go home to lay with his own wife because Uriah said, how can I go to my wife while we have men that are in battle that are dying? David, I can't do that. So he stayed in the palace all night and he found out Uriah didn't go home. The progression of sin. David now, he's, he's baffled. Oh my God. What, uh, what, why didn't you go to your wife? He goes and gets Uriah. Why didn't you go home to your wife? He said, dude, people are dying in battle. The, the actual kingdom is under duress. David, I won't want nothing to happen to you as I love you and I love this kingdom. And he was showing more righteousness toward the things of God than David, the man after God's own heart. And he would not leave David. I wish to God that we would have a mind like Uriah. I'm not going to let anything separate me from the love of God. I'm not going to let any situation separate me from doing what I need to do for God because I love God. And when you love something, as I told you, when you love something, it'll be seen. Your passion will go that way. This man, Uriah, loved David and loved the things of God more than his own wife and decided, I'm not going to be with my wife so I can have a quick fix overnight so I can soothe my flesh in sex. But he said, no, I'm not doing that. I'm going to stay right here and protect my king and protect the kingdom of God that God gave us. So David made another decision. He decided, I'm going to send Uriah back to the war. Not only did he say, I'm going to send Uriah back to the war, but he told his general Joab, what I want you to do, I want you to put, I want you to put Uriah at the forefront of the battle. I want you to put them out in front of all the other men and bring them in close to the walls of the enemy, to the walls and, and bring them close to the, the enemies that they were fighting out at the time. And he said, then when you're close, I want you to retreat some of the men so that Uriah will be killed. He went from a liar or I should say from lying to fornicating to being an adulterer. Now he's about to be a murderer. And he's involved other people in the kingdom. He involved Joab because Joab is the general and Joab knows the plan that David has. So what does Joab do? Joab does what he's commanded to do. And sure enough, when they went and had uh, Uriah to be on the front, they retreated. His own men, David called for the men to retreat and leave Uriah out there so Uriah would be killed in battle. And that's exactly what happened. And then Joab went and reported back to David and told David, sent messenger to David and said, David, the man Uriah is dead. He was struck down by the arrows of our enemies. And David had the nerve to say, well, who knows when the Lord's will is and it comes to our lives? Who knows? He knew. 
And then David took this man's wife, Bathsheba, and married her so that it would look like the child that she had now is legitimate because look, David was with her. That child could have been prematurely born. That's why it would maybe be six months or so. So David is now taking his ease. He has this, this man's wife. He has Bathsheba as his wife. And he feels like things are going all right. But the Bible says this here. And this was in uh, 2 Samuel, the 12th chapter. And I'm going to explain it just for the lack of time. If you get a chance to read the 12th chapter of 2 Samuel. The Bible says that while David was on the throne, that the prophet, don't you know it is good to have a prophet? It is good to have a man or a woman of God, someone that can speak in your life. You all don't know how blessed you really are uh, to have anybody that can speak in your life. And I, I'm not just saying because of me or anything like that, but I'm telling you, you want to be able to have someone in your life that can hear from God better than you. So this man, his name is Nathan. He's a prophet of God. And he comes to see David. And when he comes to see David, David looks at him and he says, hey, Nathan, how are you doing? What, 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 what's going on? And Nathan, and Nathan says, oh, uh, King, I want to tell you about a situation that's happening in the kingdom. So you know already, David wants to hear it. David's like, I am very in the, in the kingdom. Oh, I give my life. I love the kingdom. Oh, don't, let me know what happened. What's going on? Nathan says, well, there were two men. One man was very rich and had all types of flocks, all types of animals. And this other man was very, very poor. And he raised up this ewe lamb. It means it's a small lamb. He raised it up from just being a small lamb. And he took it into him and he embraced it. And it was almost as if it was like family to him. Well, one day there was a visitor that came into town and wanted to visit the rich man. And the rich man decided to make a dinner for this actual man that was visiting. And instead of taking one of his many, many flocks that he had, he took the man's ewe lamb away from him. He took it and stole it away from this man that only had one lamb. He took it and offered him it up and offered it for himself so that he could feed this visitor. David hears about it. David said, what? That man should be killed. And we're going to make sure that after he's killed, he's going to restore fourfold of everything that he's taken. That man should be killed. Nathan sits there and looks at David. And he says, David, thou art the man. And then he began to prophesy to him. I'll be teaching on spiritual gifts in the upcoming weeks. I'll be teaching on spiritual gifts. So you'll get a chance to understand what, about prophecy, about tongues, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, uh, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. You'll get a chance to learn about all those. I'll be starting a series on the actual uh, spiritual gifts. But he began talking to David and he began to prophesy. And he said, David, when you were yet a child, I nurtured you. I brought you into me. I loved you. I gave you, I spared your life from Saul and from all the evil that was to befall you. I not only that, but I even gave you to be as a king. I caused you to win many battles. And yet even in that, I gave you not just that, but I gave you wives and I gave you children. I gave you all these things. And if you would have asked me for anything else, David, I would have given it to you. But you took this man's wife, Uriah. You took Uriah's wife. Not only did you take his wife, but you laid with her. You fornicated with her. Not only did you fornicate with, with her, but you had that man killed. And you go and make it as if it was nothing. And David's sitting here and listening to all the things that he thought was hidden. And because he knew that what Nathan was saying was true, he could not face it by himself. 
So he had to come to a point where he just said, God, I have sinned. I have sinned. It is me who have sinned and me alone that has sinned. The entire 51st chapter of Psalms identifies David writing his sins, writing the things that he had done, his ungodliness. And I want you to know this. David had to admit that it was not, he didn't blame it on anyone else. And you wonder, how could this man ever be forgiven? Because David was responsible, he was a murderer also. How are you a man after God's own heart? You're a murderer. How are you a man after God's own heart? You're a fornicator. How are you a man after God's own heart? You're a liar. How are you a man? And I want you to know how he became a man of God is he had to not only forgive those who've done things against him, like we saw how he forgave Saul, but he had to learn how to forgive himself. And the question is, how do we forgive ourselves when we know we're responsible for doing something? We may have caused people's lives. We may have caused people hurt, harm, danger. How do we get loose from that? How do we say, Lord, I want to I, I want to think about it. I still feel the pain of it. And some of us, we just have swept it so far under the rug that we just don't want to even mention it. We have placed it in places in the clandestine area of our mind where we'll say, I put it in there, I've lost the key, I just have to live with it, I'll go to, I'll go to my grave with it. I'm not, and God is saying you don't have to live with it. Because I want you to know this. Many of us have been living with ghosts. When I say living with ghosts, and this is what I mean. When we confess our sins, the Bible says, according to 1 John 1 and 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Saints of God, people of God, it does not matter what you do or what you have done. It doesn't matter if you were a murderer. It doesn't matter if you were a liar, you were a fornicator, or you did all these uh, theft. You can go through a litany of all the different sins of the flesh. What you've got to do is you've got to realize God forgave me and God will forgive me, but Lord, I've got to do something to show that I am godly sorry, sorrow. And the Bible says godly sorrow works about repentance. If you want God to forgive you of that thing that you say that you couldn't forgive yourself for, I want you to know he has done that. But what you've got to do is you've got to let that go, but you've got to turn another way. Some of the things that were in my life that I still cannot talk about, and it doesn't mean you have to talk about them. You should know them for yourself. But things that I had to let go in my life that hurt me so bad that even to think about it would hurt and would cut me. And I couldn't, I don't feel like I could do things like I would do. God said, I need you to let it go because I've forgiven you of it. And if I've forgiven you of it, how I know that you appreciate my forgiving you of it is that you'll forgive others of it and you'll go another way. A lot of our forgiveness ties into how we treat others. If you say you have a hard time forgiving others, I know why you have a hard time forgiving yourself because you want to hold on to your own unrighteousness so that it gives you a reason to do that against others also. A lot of times the reason why people don't forgive themselves is because if I forgive myself and I know the wrong that I have done, that means that myself, if I can forgive myself, I can also forgive them. A lot of times people just don't want to forgive others and we don't want to forgive ourselves. And another reason people hold on to unforgiveness a lot of times, they want people to feel sorry for them. I'll never forgive myself for this. I'll never. The highest form of exaltation is to be able to hold on to something that God has taken from you. The highest form of exaltation is to hold on to anything that God has taken from you. If he's taken away your sins and he's forgiven you of your sins, who are you to hold on to your sins? That is a slap, a smite in the face of God. 
So I want you all to know today how we are forgiven of those things from our past because David got past this. And even though uh, he had some judgment that he had to deal with because of his actions, David was able to go and say, you know what, Lord, it was me and me alone. He didn't blame Bathsheba. He didn't blame the other person. He didn't blame it was on these other people. He blamed himself because ultimately we are the keepers of ourselves and what we do. But it should draw us to a place of thanking God that he has forgiven us of things that we could not forgive ourselves. But now that we have the knowledge of it, as we see the light, walk therein. I'm free. The things I didn't know, I wasn't proud of it, and I don't keep on revisiting it. I don't keep on going back to it and keep on picking it up. And, oh, what was I? I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done it. It is right where it is. It's in my past, and I've gone past my past, so I'm not going back to get it. It's gone. I'm saying this to you all. you got to come next week. Bite your friends next week, because next week I'm going to be concluding the whole thing on forgiveness, but next week I'm going to be talking about how to conclude the past, how to conclude everything that you had to deal with, all your shortcomings, all your faults, all your flaws, all your dislikes, all your unforgiveness on things, how to just conclude it. Listen, take these. next week we're taking these weights off. We're taking them off so that we'll all be able to live a life conducive to the life of Christ. So I pray today, like I said, I'm going to be ending right now. I pray today that you all got something, uh, a lot out of it. There's a lot in today, and I realize it. I normally ask a lot of questions or more questions. I'll be asking more questions in next week. But this week was kind of more intense because God wanted us to deal with it and be dealing with ourselves throughout this week so that we know we can just let it go. If God has forgiven us, the highest form of exaltation, exaltation is to be able to hold on to anything that God has taken away from us. So without any further ado, I love you all. Let me go ahead and just say a prayer in closing, and then we'll be talking. You'll get a memory verse uh, probably tomorrow, and then you'll be having questions all throughout the week. So God bless you all, and hear me pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, I want to thank you. I want to praise you for each and everything that have been said today, Lord. Father, I pray that my words will not fall on deaf ears. I pray, Lord God, that you use me to say what you'd have me to say, Lord. And Father God, that your people would be blessed and that they would be enriched and that they would know just to let it go. And Father, realize that whatever you have forgiven us of and which have been everything, Lord, that not only do we forgive ourselves, but we forgive others also, Lord, because, Lord, we know that such is the will of God. Bless each and every person that have heard the word of God today, Lord, and keep them. Bless their families, Lord God. Cause them to have a peaceful and a restful day, Lord, and use them mightily, Lord, for the building of thy kingdom. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God bless y'all. Love y'all. Y'all have a wonderful day now. Take care. Bye-bye.